So, we had a question about sine bars. Is it with a G or like sine is a cosine? <laughs> you ain't ruined my boo boo. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I was going to say, I'll go ahead and say, first thing you need to know about a sign bar is how to spell it. <laughs> S-I-N-E. Okay, it's not a bar sign as in, yes, a sign on the wall. But you use it to signify or sign an angle. So, um, the basic design of the bar is... Bar of steel generally, like that, and it's got a V in here, comes along the other side, has a V over here, and then uh, <clears throat> generally in here will be a couple holes, and there will be a shaft on each end that you'll set in it, and it'll attach with a screw on each of them. So the point being that this is a bar with a fixed center distance between there. And that center distance, common ones for inch, are four, five, 10. Um, used, six used to be common two years ago. Uh, it doesn't look to be quite so common right now, and, but six was one of the ones that was offered when I was going to college that we could make a six inch sign bar. Mm. Um, 10 inch is real good. <clears throat> anyway, fixed distance what you that you know what the distance is is the big key there and when you make these you grind the angles here on a surface grinder so that you know they're all straight and then if you <clears throat> while you're making one if you want to know what the distance between these two well it's really hard to measure accurately from the V to the V it's pretty easy if you take your pins on the end if they hang over the side of the bar a little bit you can measure with a mic in between the two pins when they're just setting in there. So then you measure on the outside of the pins and you know that that's the distance and you know if you're not square, if you're testing this and you go to the other side of it, it would measure different at one side than the other yeah. of the pin as it goes across through the bar. Because of course our end picture of the bar would be here and then we'd have our round sticking out a little ways from each side, which yeah, you can see the square too. <clears throat> okay, so when we go to use this, the point is that we have a flat plane that we're putting it on. We use some kind of a spacer. And then our bar is setting on these rounds and also on its V. So what this does is it can give us a precision angle. And if we go back to our basic trig, <clears throat> and I say basic trig, um, I have the three functions of trig that I remember, the three that are the most common. The others I pretty much have ignored unless I need it for some reason, and then I go back and look it up, don't think about it. The, and, and I'm going to do this because it kind of made it easier for me to remember it because I was like, I got to be able to remember these for when I need to actually use them in, in figuring stuff out without looking it up. And so your most basic of all, your, your, as far as the name of it, the most basic is the sign, okay? And the sign is the side opposite over the hypotenuse. So that would be side opposite over the hypotenuse. Now, <clears throat> the cosine is the, and, and what it is, re, when I say side opposite, that's referring to this angle right here, because that is the angle that we're measuring, and that would be the side opposite. If we were doing this this way, if, and I did that to match the picture that we're at here. If I were doing this angle, then this would no longer be the side opposite because what the reference is to the angle that you're measuring. So the side in that case would be the 
site adjacent or SA. But we're going to go back and uh, make that site opposite yet. I'm going to move the angle there and put the angle back in here. And so that the site adjacent is over here. And the reason I say that is then, you know, since the sine, well, cosine, it's the opposite. So I remember that the cosine is the sine side adjacent over the hypotenuse. And then the only one we got left, which is the most common one you use in machine work. The most common one of all is the tangent. And the tangent is the side opposite over the side adjacent. So, and the reason, since you know it's the two sides, the tangent is the one that doesn't deal with the hypotenuse. So it's different than the sine and cosine, but at the same time, since it's not a co, it's not an opposite one, the side opposite goes on the top again. <coughs> <coughs> not an 8 O, it's not 80, it's an S O, side opposite over side adjacent. And so that's how I remember them when I, when I need to. Now granted you can look that up on your computer probably quicker than I just described them, but if that makes sense to you, that is a way that you can just Remember them even when you haven't done trig for 20 years. Because I've, I've had points in my life where I was just strictly, uh, you're doing wrenching on uh, stuff in a diesel shop, you know, for two years. You don't use trig, you know. But if you decide to, eh, in a little while, you can think about it and it comes back to you. So now, the reason why this here again, why the bar is called the sign, the hypotenuse is where the name of the sine, come, the sine bar comes from because it is the hypotenuse length. This height here is what size gauge blocks you would stack up. And when you buy a gauge block set, <clears throat> a set of different precision blocks that you can stack up to make a relatively accurate stack. I won't say absolutely precision, there is no absolute precision, and if you're stacking a lot of, like I, I did some stuff in the shop one day with uh, some mic accuracy, and I was just using gauge blocks for that. I was using individual gauge blocks. <clears throat> Each individual gauge block, um, they'll be off by a, a maybe you know a couple millionths or a co or even a hundred thousandths of an inch if they're lower quality ones. If they are uh, as long as they're a calibrated, <clears throat> traceable gauge block, each one of them will be marked with how much it's off. So you can then actually take your gauge block, you keep that paper with that set or it's never as good. And you take that, pa that information that's with that set and you can add up all the differences and you can come up with the amount, you'll know how much it's off. When you're all done, is it off a half a thousandths because we had a whole bunch of minuses or is it, or did we come up with a combination where this one was minus, that one was plus, and it's just really, really close. So, but that's the general idea. Something to keep in mind here too, not that it is, for the most part, it just works, but when you're two points for your distance, now these V's here are this distance to that one. And what we're really concerned about is the distance center to center on the round so that as they roll, but our contact point is not in the centers. Your contact point will be here and here. So if your base is not flat, you're not going to be accurate either. If your base has a little wobble, if it's sort of flat. So it, it, uh, everything adds up for your little, little inaccuracies that can happen. If we want to do one here, and I'm going to pick one out real quick just for fun, and since we do have, where did I, I carry it out, a calculator? Okay, it doesn't matter anyway. We could look it up in a trig ta table, we could use our calculator, or we could remember the one I was going to come up with anyway. <laughs> so, if we want to do 30 degree angle, 30, that's a three, three zero, 30 degree angle, we would look up the sine of 30 and we would find out that it's one half. So if we have a 
bar here that is a 10 inch bar, we'd want to have five inches out here. And that would give us a 30 degree angle. And part of why I wanted to mention that was so that when we go out in the shop, there's another little uh, trick associated with sign bars. Uh, it's not with sign bars, but with the 30 degree angle that I will mention. Uh, but I'll mention that when we're out in the shop. The reason why I was going through the sign bar is because a gentleman had written in a question on uh, easy ways to use the sign bar to line up <clears throat> your compound on a lathe. So now let's go out to a compound. And we have one that's been put straight for whatever reason. Half a degree back straight. Hmm. Okay. I don't know how, how why, but it was, which is fine. They're meant to move. And his problem, what he was wanting to do, and I see a lot of people do this, because once they understand a sign bar, they find, fall in love with a sign bar. Um, I honestly don't own one. I didn't make one in school. I had a different project. My project in school was that I uh, made a 420 new process transmission that was for a 65 Dodge. I made that so that it could mate up to a, I forget the brand now. Um, anyway, it's a number 18 transfer case that comes in the old Willys pickups. And I was going to put that in my 49 Willys pickup with a slant six, which never did get done, but the transmission got done. So that was my college project at that point instead of making a sign bar or something. And the shaft came out really cool. And I don't know if the transmission still is around or not. I gave it to a friend of mine that uh, had an automotive machine shop. I don't know if, I, I know he wouldn't have thrown it out, but I don't know if it ever got used for anything or if it's still sitting in his uh, spare parts. So anyway, his problem was <clears throat> he had seen people where they put the sign bar across here, you get your marks and then you dial in on the sign bar as you move your carriage back and forth to get this at an angle. Well, while that can work, it's not, <coughs> it's not the way I usually do it. And his problem was that the outside of his compound was not accurate. And so, um, so since his compound was not accurate, it was, you know, just rough out here. He didn't have any way to do it. What I do is I do it differently. I just never do that on these. And I very seldom, like I say, I just, I do not own a sign bar. I have a few precision ground angles where they're just angles of steel, just like a precision square. Um, I've got a few of those that are at different angles that are real common. Okay. Got to be one that goes in there on that lock screw, I thought. Oh, I know why. It's already loose. Normally, we leave that tight <clears throat> when we're not using it. And it was probably being used. We were using the collet. We were facing. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'll have to ask about that. It kind of looks like it might have been being used as a feed, which when you have a readout, I don't quite understand why, but it'd be interesting to see. So, point being, if we have an angle on, uh, on this here, we can, and we just, we'll, we'll see, we'll put this at 30 for fun. And what we can do is we can turn this. And if you turn this, instead of having to think of your sign bar, do I have a two inch, a four inch, uh, whatever length sign bar, imagine that this movement is your sign bar. Because it's the same thing if you move on an angle as it would be if you were measuring between an angle. So this one here, the, 
the movement on this is uh, 200 thousandths. So every five turns would be an inch. So I would go one, two, three, four, five, and that would give me one inch, and then I'd keep doing that, which I don't feel like doing right now. I'm lazy, I'm getting old. Uh, and, and you'd put in an indicator here so that as you move, the indicator gives you your, your reading. Now, of course, your indicator, if we're doing this where we really need to be, strict, be accurate, you want your indicator on what you're indicating on to be square. Most of the time, you're going to be good enough if you just eyeball it once you have a, developed a machinist's eye. But um, to start out with, or if you need it to be accurate, you can use a little precision square to angle up, you know, to square up your indicator. You need to be, of course, as you are moving and getting this reading, you need to be on something that is square with the machine. Uh, the machine weighs. This is not square with the machine necessarily. This is, but, but, but this is a problem in a multitude of ways. One is it's on an angled surface. So since we're trying to measure straight in and out, it's not a very good surface to use because any rising and falling in our movement will affect our reading to where it's not accurate. <clears throat> if we happen to have a precision ground lengthwise uh, straight on our lathe, and some do on the ways, they're also not very good because it's a long distance from your tool post down to your ways. The best thing to use generally and most of the time you will have that because you're making a one-off part and you roughed it to start with. Usually you roughed it. So you can't get any straighter with the running of the machine than something you just turned. So you just, you got, you're going to make a taper on a four inch part before we even start roughing the taper in at all, even if you're going to step it in or something, while it's all straight, turn a straight section and then indicate on that straight section to set up your angle before you do more of your roughing. So you've got that adjusted while you have something that's true with the machine. Generally, a uh, edge of a adapter like this for a collet chuck or the edge of your chuck, a lot of times that'll give you a four inch longer so that you can dial on. Now, if we're, we need to go back and do a little bit more math on that part of it. Uh, because if we're doing what's more common with things, then it's not that often in a drawing that you need exactly a five or a 10 degree angle in this day and age. Usually those are fairly rough uh, measurements. It will be more a matter of that for 100 millimeters, you need a 10 millimeter movement. It'll be a you know, one in 10 ratio. Or if it is inch, it'll be five eighths of an inch per foot, something like that. So now it's not that same movement here equals your sign for your angle. And of course, whatever you set your compound on is half of your angle. Because you're, you're in, if you're making a point or, or a taper, it's half of your angle is what you're moving here. And the big thing that I was wanting to mention here, which is an old trick or old knowledge about things and not, um, not too much of a factor these days. Those numbers there are kind of dirty. Yeah. There's the mine. Trying to find the 60 on there. That's normally where you, you keep your <laughs> compound at a 60 or a 29. We, may, we should go through that someday, why you go to 29 instead of 60. That has to do with threading a 60 degree thread. And you keep it at this angle because of the value in making single point threads and because of uh, clearance. It gives you a little more extension into your cutting area a little bit further away from the other side of your carriage, you've just got more, more room in there, the way that the machine is made. But then there's another thing, which is that if old timey before we had a digital readout, we've came up here, we got a section we're trying to thin out on a disc. 
where we can measure it real easy off the back side to the front side. We've taken a cut across here. We just measured it and we know that we need to take off four and a half thousandths. So since we know we need to take off four and a half thousandths, and since we know the sine of 30 degrees, which is essentially what our 60 on this machine is setting us is 30 off of straight, we know that to take our four and a half thousandths we need to take, all we need to do is move this dial by nine, just twice as much. So if you're the, one of those guys out there without a digital readout, older machine, that is a real good trick for facing. I used to use it all the time. Uh, I've kind of forgot it since I put the digital readouts on and thinking about the sign bar this morning, it just reminded me to mention that. I haven't really used it for a long time because I've got the digitals on the lathes here now. So let's go back and talk a little bit about our other angles that we might, uh, might be running into. <clears throat> and we will need a calculator for that. Just use a different color. So <clears throat> where, uh, normal thing we'd have, should use one that's bright enough to see though. Um, we have a shaft. This is a really common one you're going to see. And I was going to look in the book originally and figure out a standard, uh, but over, it'll have a taper specified. And I'm going to go with 12 inch because we're in the US. And over 12 inches, it will say a taper of 5 eighths inch per, per foot, per foot, 5 eighths inch per foot. So in 12 inches, what they're saying is the diameter, um, um, that the diameter is smaller by 5 eighths of an inch here. So that would mean simply if this end here was 1 and 5 eighths, that this end would be one inch. So on our trig looking at this, what we have is we have an angle of, for cutting this, the angle we're gonna cut it from. We're gonna be at uh, five eighths of an inch thicker on this side, and this one's gonna be tapered down to zero in our theoretical when we set up our angle. The thing here is that I wanna point out is this is 12 inches. When we're working with this on a sign bar, when we're working at it on our uh, compound, we're using the dial on the hypotenuse. So that's not the 12 inches. Now, if it's a really flat angle, most of the time you'll get away with it, and I'm sure many of us have, and then realize later that we made a small boo-boo. Because the difference between the <clears throat> 12 inches uh, with five-eighths of an inch on the hypotenuse or not is not a whole lot. In fact, we can calculate that out by doing squares. And this is always a good one to know on uh, <clears throat> if there's a right angle. A little square signifies that that's a right angle uh, besides the fact that in our mind we knew that I drew it that way. And so on a right angle triangle, you take your squares of your sides and this is the longest one. Obviously, the hypotenuse is the longest, so you can always remember that this one squared, if you subtract it from either of the other two, will give you the one that's left. Or you square this and square this. So what I'll, what I'll do here is 12 squared is 144. And 5 eighths squared is 25 60 fourths. But We'd rather have it all in decimals where we can let the calculator do it. Uh, and the 25 64 is the old 5 eighths times 5 eighths. I don't know if they still do that in school now or not, showing you how that's done. Um, but the old way it was done was 5 eighths, and to do it longhand times 5 eighths, you multiply 5 by 5 gives you 25, and the 8 by 8 gives you the 64. And that's your answer of multiplying the two without having to make them into digits. But if I go 0.625 and then I square it, comes out with 0.390, which is real close to 2564, 625. Um, and I add my 144, and then I go for a square root. 
Um, okay, I didn't, I forgot to put Chad. 144. Uh, okay, I'm going to do that again. 0.625 squared plus 144 equals 144.390. And now I push square root. So what we've got difference in the 12, this point right here is 12.016. So if you were figuring this particular angle to get the exactly right ratio, ratio you'd have to move 16 thousandths longer to look for your five. Uh, we're actually doing this on a single side here. This is supposed to be five sixteenths. I was doing a double angle. So I actually did not do that correctly. Um, so this, this amount here will be less yet. Uh, but I wasn't a bit done a 5 sixteenths in my head for multiplying it out, so a little sideline math there that's kind of fun anyway. Um, <clears throat> so again, let's go, go 5 sixteenths and square that plus 144 equals that. Then we go with square root. Okay, this is more what I run into on things like this most of the time. This should be four thousandths of an inch longer. And that's where I've seen many people do this wrong and still get it close enough. Because you're, you're dialing in five eighths of an inch per foot on the taper is real close to a Morris taper socket. And you look up what it actually is and if you're using one or the other, it's not that big a deal. Now, let's do something else here too. Let's bring this down to what we actually, you're not gonna dial 12 inches in. You're, you're not going to do, that's insane. So we'd have 5 sixteenths for, for over 12.04 <clears throat> 12 thousandths, which um, on your, your compound, let's pick a reasonable number. Let's pick four inches. Let's say we want to move four inches, okay? And in relation to our four inches is 12... <coughs> 0 0.004, and I'll use the whole accurate amount since we know what it is this time. Okay, in the uh, 12 inches we had 0.3125 that we had want, wanted there, 5 sixteenths, and you set that up as an equal ratio, and yeah, I use equal ratios real simple math thing all the time, solving for fractions and equal things. It uh, works out really easy because you do the cross multiplication. So <coughs> <coughs> we do our 0.3125 times four equals one and a quarter. And we divide that by 12.004 and that equals, yeah, Oh, duh. I am definitely coming up with the right answer. <laughs> yeah, my mind is foggy today. I thought I was clear. My mind is foggy today. Uh, hopefully it's not a permanent condition setting in. One, zero, four. <laughs> and then we have one, six. So we're going to just round it off and leave it at 104. Um, yeah. For some reason, I was looking for a bigger number. It was, it, it was, yeah, yeah, I could have, this was what I was doing before. Same, same thing, basically, just it set it up different, and there's, so, the point is, when you travel four inches, this would be the indicator that you're reading that you're looking for straight in and out when you are correctly at five-eighths of an inch per foot of taper. Okay. And, uh. Yeah, for some reason I was expecting the result in reverse. I was expecting to find the, the 4, which makes no sense when I was putting the 4 in as a, I was expecting to find a 4 something answer, which would just be one to one and is not what we were searching for. What we were searching for is what would that result be if we traveled 4 inches. And the same thing, you just, if you had, if you're using a sign bar to set up uh, you'd do the same thing except you just put five inches out here and this again um, let's say we get, we've 
got five inches and we're trying to set this up on a sign bar. So we'd have our 0 0.3125 and we would be times five divided by our 12.004 and that equals 0.13 and I'm going to round it off to zero again. But the po big point here is there's really no reason to be setting this on a sign bar at all. We got to go through this extra backwards calculation to figure out essentially what, what it is uh, when we're really just looking for a distance, X amount of travel, where the sign bar has its shining moment is when you want one degree, two degrees, uh, 12 and a half, or 8.69 degrees. It could be a specific, but it's more a matter of relating to degrees more so than a amount of travel per travel. And where I say travel per travel also is, <clears throat> that's why we get into the tangent being so important that I was mentioning earlier, and you can go back in the video, I'm not going to redraw it all, but it's because we're always working with side opposite, side adjacent, because, not always, but because that's the way most of your accurate tapers, most of your accurate angles in machining, whether it's metric, whether it's inch, it's normally written by the amount of rise over run is what they call it. And you'll, you'll hear that a lot with carpenters a lot, the rise over the run. That's, that's when you talk about your pitch on your roof is your 412, raises up four foot for moving out 12 foot, 412 angle, or four inches for 12 inches out, since that's why they picked 12. <laughs> because of inches, not because of 12 foot. I just, <clears throat> same, same idea either way though. Um, when you're dealing with metrics, they like to think above the measuring uh, system. And a lot of people in engineering today, even in inches, will think above the measuring system in this regard. And what they'll do, and they're doing it in part because it's, it's everything's supposed to be based on but they'll go to a 10 there. So you might have a 10 inches, and then they'll have over here would be something like 1.25 inches if this was based on a base 10. Or it would be 10, uh, be, they'd have 100 millimeters. And you'd end up with the same angle and 12.5 millimeters over here. So, Point being that they may they work out with a even on this one again though That is off of the side adjacent to where we're setting our angle not the hypotenuse sign bars deal with hypotenuse mm. and On these flat angles you can get away with it most of the time, you know over a foot four thousandths of an inch difference in your length to set that taper It doesn't matter it really doesn't matter. You, you could, um, the, the steel will expand that much when you're squishing it together where you get a pretty good fit anyway if it's a fitting taper. But when you get to a steep taper, it matters a lot. And you will have things that will go rattle, rattle if you got the wrong two pieces trying to fit together when it's a steep taper. And so hopefully that answers the man's question and a few others for people.